Welcome back. This past long weekend was quite eventful here on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea on Sunday test fired a series of short range ballistic missiles in response to an earlier joint naval drill by South Korea and the U.S. For more, I have Professor Kim Yonuk from the Korean National Diplomatic Academy joining the session virtually. Of course, Professor Kim, welcome back. I also have Professor Robert Kelly at the Pusan National University live on the line as well. Professor Kelly, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Professor Kim, we'll start with you then. South Korea and the U.S. launched eight missiles of their own in the wee hours of Monday in response to a volley of eight short-range ballistic missiles tested by North Korea Sunday morning, as I mentioned earlier. Now, more recently, Professor Kim, yesterday, the two countries staged an aerial exercise involving fighter jets. What are your thoughts on this response strategy, if I may? Um, I think the uh, South Korean government, along with the U.S. government, uh, is, is now changing its... Uh, military strategies, excuse me. I think especially on the uh, U.S. extended deterrence uh, to South Korea. Uh, you know, we have witnessed at the uh, U.S.-South Korea summit meeting how two countries are trying to change the deterrence capabilities and deterrence tactics against North Korea. Uh, I think one of the uh, important thing is to show a more timely and coordinated a way of uh, showing the extended deterrence capabilities. Uh, before, whenever North Korea shot the missiles or tested nuclear weapons, what U.S. and South Korea did was pretty much after the event. Uh, I mean, after North Korea, uh, you know, did the military provocation, then two countries began to respond to those uh, uh, provocations. But I think uh, this is kind of changing now. I mean, the U.S based upon a, uh, uh, you know, very uh, keen information uh, capability, uh, catches up a very exact timeline of North Korea's uh, missile launches and also, um, you know, nuclear uh, uh, testing schedules. So I think that now the U.S. and South Korea is trying to uh, respond in a very timely manner, uh, very timely, and even even before the North Korea's provocation, they are very actively and and proactively and prevent preventively responding to North Korea's new, uh, military provocations. Right. And before we delve further into the response, then Professor Kelly, North Korea this past Sunday is believed to have set a single day record for ballistic missile tests with a total of eight launches over a span of 35 minutes. How do you explain this escalation in provocation? Sure. I think that North Koreans have broadly sort of concluded in the last few years that there is no deterrence. There is no sort of conclusive package out there waiting. Oh, pardon me, there is no detente. There is no sort of conclusive package out there waiting. Trump is gone. Moon Jae-in is gone, right? We're sort of back to the status quo, which is sort of deterrence and containment, isolation and sanction of North Korea, which is more or less what we've been doing for several decades, bar those few years with Trump and, and Moon. And so the North Koreans are figuring, you know, hey, I mean, like, what's the, you know, why, why not keep testing, right? I mean, there is a sort of legitimate argument, I suppose, an engineering argument for testing, which is that the North Koreans increasingly rely on missiles, so they want to test them. But now you have a new president in both South Korea and the United States, right? And the North Koreans want to sort of remind us all that, you know, they are an important nuclear power and they're not going to be bullied and everything else. I think part of that particularly is because of the way Yoon um, spoke, particularly when he sort of threatened preemption. During the, uh, during the campaign, and the North Koreans traditionally respond pretty badly to that sort of thing and do tests like this, and so, you know, here we are. Right. Professor Kim, North Korea has engaged in testing its missile technology on 18 different occasions this year alone, as my colleague Pei Unji mentioned earlier. How do you explain this frequency, then, in provocation? Um, I think, uh, you know, North Korea is now... Uh, changing uh, tactics. I mean, it's uh, shooting very different missiles, uh, new strategic missiles, and also it changed its uh, nuclear, uh, you know, strategies. It, it clarified at the last month's parade that Kim Jong-un mentioned that, uh, you know, nuclear first use is possible. So I think this is something based upon, possible based upon a very solid China-North Korea relations, I think. Um, and I think North Korea is trying to show something more than, uh, you know, much more different than before. These kinds of uh, new um, military strategy 
uh, nullifies the South Korea's missile defense systems. And I think uh, this is partly, I think, because of uh, the uh, North Korea's domestic economic distress. You know, it failed the five-year recovery program and uh, re reinitiated a another five-year economic uh, you know, recovery program. So I think uh, Kim Jong Un needs something much bigger and much stronger, you know, policy, you know, momentum compared to the past, which also is a very strong message to the United States and South Korea. Right. And Professor Kelly, neighboring Japan and the U.S. conducted a joint military exercise right after North Korea's missile launches this past Sunday. That being said, do you suppose these regional retaliatory measures will discourage further acts of provocation by North Korea? Almost certainly not. But I think we should send the signal to the North Koreans that if they actually were to launch at South Korea or Japan, that we would be able to strike back at exactly the point of fire. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing now this emphasis on immediate counter launch. The idea is to establish a very short sort of fire, counter fire, sort of battery, counter battery relationship so that the North Koreans actually were to use one of these things, we would immediately strike back. That strikes me as wise, although I'm a little bit worried that it could actually sort of slide into a kind of tit for tat thing, right? The North Koreans launch and then we sort of say, well, we're going to launch back and it kind of starts to spiral out of control. I would sort of caution about that a little bit. I think this is sort of Part of the idea behind this is sort of, like I said, sort of President Yoon's sort of insistence on preemption from earlier this year. I think this is sort of designed to do that, right, to sort of show that if North Koreans actually do this stuff, look, we have the ability to immediately strike back. I think that's sort of part of a large, sorry, I mean, go on here. I think it's part of a larger sort of problem for South Korea, which is increasingly that North Korea's sort of military threat to South Korea is missiles, right? You're seeing a missileization of the contest on the peninsula, and South Korea's options are pretty poor because missile defense doesn't work terribly well. And I think this is one of the reasons why Yoon was talking about preemption, and therefore we're seeing these sort of emphases on, uh, on, on exercises and, and, and counter-strikes. Right, we are. Professor Kim, despite its uh, blatant violations of UN Security Council resolutions, North Korea is currently chairing the UN Disarmament Forum. That being said, how does that particular reality look to affect the credibility of this particular forum, do you think? Uh, this is really a uh, funny uh, situation. North Korea is now chairing the disarmament forum from maybe May 30th to June 24th. So uh, in the period in which North Korea is chairing this forum, North Korea just uh, shooting the missiles and possibly nuclear test is possible. Um, maybe North Korea would think that it already possesses uh, nuclear weapons and wants a uh, armament, uh, you know, uh, you know, dialogue with with this armament dialogue with the United States together, uh, thinking that uh, you know the reality is different. Of course, the U.S. policy towards North Korea is that denuclearization of North Korea is the objective of North Korea policy. But uh, of course, reality is that North Korea already possesses nuclear weapons. That's I think North Korea's position. But uh, throughout throughout the uh, you know period you know from from when North Korea became a member of the United Nations it began to uh, you know uh, develop nuclear weapons and tested nuclear weapons so I don't think it really a uh, uh, in reality it's very uh, you know weird weird uh, situation that North Korea uh, you know in the pro in the process of developing its nuclear weapons, and finally possessed nuclear weapons, but uh, is now chairing a, a disarmament forum. This is really a um, such a weird situation, I think. Right, it really is. Professor Kelly, staying with the UN, the US efforts to impose stronger sanctions against North Korea within the framework of the UN Security Council were vetoed by China and Russia. Do you expect a similar standoff, even after a nuclear test, by, perhaps, by North Korea? And if that is the case, Professor Kelly, what do you propose to better deal with that situation? <laughs> I have no better solution to this than anybody else, which is why we're still talking about it after 70 years. Um, I, I, would I would be surprised if the Chinese and the Russians would support the sanctions. It was pretty tough for the Americans to sort of squeeze that out in the past, right? I mean, they've supported us on nine previous ones. So I would be surprised if they were to do that again. I think the Chinese have made it fairly clear that they really want the Americans to make concessions towards North Korea in order to motivate some movement towards denuclearization. Um, so I would be surprised. Even the, the nuclear test might cause a little bit of sort of shaking on this, but I would be surprised if it pushed them in that direction. Um, I think, at the, so he asked sort of for my opinion. 
Um, I think the real issue at the multilateral level not, so, is not so much more sanctions than it is really enforcement. Um, right? There's actually, I mean, North Korea is actually fairly heavily cordoned off, right? particularly since we started with sectoral, what we call sectoral sanctions on North Korea a few years back in late 2017. The real issue, I would argue, is to actually sort of enforce them. What we really got to do is get the Chinese and the Russians to actually help us to kick North Korean money out of their banks, for example. That would be a really big one, right? Or just, or just patrol the EC, for example, and make sure that we can get photographs of the North Koreans doing ship to ship transfers. I mean, that's, I think, where we really need to sort of move. And, and I would imagine there might be some space after the nuclear test to sort of at least get the Chinese on board with that a little bit, not the Russians, right? The Russians are out of the box on that for a while because of the Ukraine war, but perhaps the Chinese. Right, hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed for that, of course. Professor Kim, there is reportedly talk about the need to reactivate the general security of military information agreement between South Korea and Japan. First of all, do you tell us a bit about this agreement and what are its prospects amid North Korea's recent provocations? Chisomia uh, is a information sharing uh, agreement between uh, Japan and Korea. It, it, it applies to uh, every, every country. Uh, and Japan, Korea uh, signed an agreement of Jisomia, which is to, to, to uh, you know, supplement each other's uh, information capabilities. Um, you know, South Korea has much better uh, information concerning North Korea and Korean Peninsula issues. So I think uh, this definitely helps Japan to get ready uh, to know what's going on in North Korea in case North Korea does any kinds of provocations. Uh, but I don't think this is a very easily uh, revitalized because Japanese position about the historical issues is very firm now. Um, you know, Japan still thinks that, uh, you know, historical issues and forced labor issues, South Korea has to come up with a solution first, uh, you know, in order to solve this out. Uh, and South Korean government, especially previous government, Moon Jae-in government, uh, initiated a, a two-track approach, which is that it tried to solve historical issues on one track and on the other track, uh, still develop relations with Japan on other issues like uh, security and North Korea and things like that. But even on that two-track approach, Japanese government's uh, position is that uh, that two-track approach is of South Korean government is to try to neglect to neglect any you know uh, South Korean government's uh, you know willingness to to solve historical issues very actively um, so that was also something that Japanese government has reservation about so I don't think uh, Jusomia is there but I don't think this is not easily revitalized maybe uh, the US is now focusing on trilateralism that would be a very good momentum but I don't think uh, you know Japan, Korea relations, especially historical issues, um, is, is something in quagmire now. So I don't think other other issues like Jisomia and security related bilateral uh, relationship, I don't think that will be really easily solved. We have to find ways to, to Right, to, I see. To we solve. really do. Professor Kelly, defense authorities and relevant officials are poised to meet in Singapore starting this coming Friday for the 19th Shangri-La uh, Dialogue. What do you suppose is the relevance of this platform, keeping in mind, of course, the change in international order amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which you mentioned, and of course, North Korea's persistent provocations? Sure. So the Shangri-La dialogue is always sort of developed, I think, from sort of fairly small beginnings and kind of like the big East Asian sort of security conference every year. I went to one a few years ago before COVID. And the big issue, of course, has always been Chinese participation. And it looks like this year Chinese participation is going to expand, which is the big thing arguably again i'm just sort of you know it's just sort of out there in the media we don't know yet um the uh uh shangri-la gives the chinese an opportunity to sort of make an argument for sort of what an east asian order ought to look like it gives a place for the americans the chinese the japanese the other major players to sort of discuss these things particularly regarding the south china sea i think that's really sort of the major flashpoint besides of course taiwan um and there really isn't a way multilaterally to discuss that in East Asia, right? There have been sort of efforts to create sort of like other kinds of dialogues associated, for example, with the ASEAN, with ASEAN, the ASEAN and regional forum and things like that. And those haven't really worked terribly well. Um, Shangri-La has hung on as sort of this big sort of high profile thing. I think, it, I think it helps that the Shangri-La dialogue is technically hosted by an NGO, by sort of a think tank, and it's not actually sort of American driven or something like that. But traditionally, the Chinese have sent a low level di uh, delegation because it was perceived as sort of anti-Chinese and Western and about containing China. 
maybe you know the coming one it will be a little bit different uh, that strikes me as sort of the big breakthrough i don't know if you'll see too much on north korea in part because i don't think north korea is really going to change terribly much right i mean i think north korea is almost sort of passe they're sort of locked in with nuclear weapons they're not going to give them up you know, i think the bigger issue in in asia in the future is really chinese behavior particularly towards taiwan and the south china sea Right. Meanwhile, Professor Kim, what is your assessment of efforts by the Yoon suk yeol administration uh, to set in motion perhaps a fresh chapter of constructive bilateral ties among um, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo? That would be trilateral ties, of course. Um, I think uh, the trilateralism was very productive uh, uh, before, before uh, Moon Jae-in government came in. Uh, of course, uh, during the Park Geun-hye government, there was some uh, friction uh, between uh, Japan and Korea about the uh, comfort woman issues. Uh, so ever since then, the trilateral uh, relationship was not very uh, much vitalized. Uh, but this is very good for the interests of South Korea. Uh, first, I think, uh, you know, by the Biden's uh, initiative, uh, you know, three countries definitely can be a very good partner about the, you know, economic security issues and global supply chain issues. Uh, we can share a lot of uh, inform, uh, good, uh, you know, productive capabilities and some, uh, you know, tech, techno, you know, original technology of the United States to form a global supply chain, which are win-win uh, strategies, and also good for the uh, how to deal with North Korea issues and also the regional security issues. So I think, uh, you know, finally, I think we are, you know, back on the track uh, about the trilateral, you know, cooperation. Right. Professor Kelly, the new administration here in South Korea has pledged to expand its presence in the international arena. Now, that being said, and beyond regional security concerns here on the Korean Peninsula, what more can be done to achieve this particular goal, do you think? Sure. I actually think there's a lot South Korea could do. You may recall when Im Young Bak was president, there was a lot of talk about Korea as like a, a, a rising middle power and a, a responsible middle power and things like that. I think there are actually a lot of ways that South Korea could sort of pick up the ball on on major issues, sort of like trade, for example, South Korea is very trade dependent, right? We know that South Korea is worried about China weaponizing interdependence, and that could be an area where China, uh, where South Korea could show leadership. Um, climate change is an obvious one. Climate change is going to affect Asia, but it's not really you know, just like everybody else, of course. And it's not really clear if there's sort of a leader on that issue in in Asia. Um, South Korea is actually pretty responsible on that, right? I mean, it's really, the big issue in Asia is Chinese emissions, but you know, South Korea could show. Leadership on that. I mean, the whole the whole host of sort of international issues out there where, where South Korea get involved, human rights or something like that, because North Korea's human rights situation, of course, is, is is really terrible. And so there are many possible issues that South Korea could sort of pick up and run with. But I think the the argument would need to be that South Korea would have to show some real sort of global governance kind of leadership, right? Some willingness to sort of make some sacrifices and sort of organize some multilateral cooperation or effort on some major issue and really sort of follow through. And I think again, there was a promise. There was some promise for that under the Lee administration, then it kind of seemed to sort of slide away. And I think the Yoon people are trying to sort of come back to that in part because I think they don't want South Korea to be sort of trapped just in sort of this tiny little space where all that matters is North Korea, right? Where, where South Korea's entire foreign policy is structured by behavior of the North. I think the Yoon people would like South Korea to have sort of wider strategic horizons, participate in more things, do more things. I'd like, for example, I think that's one of the reasons why the aircraft carrier has been an idea in the last, you know, six months or something like that. All of that suggests that South Korea is sort of growing out of being locked into this one tiny little space. And I think that's why this is appealing. And it would be good, too, right? I mean, South Korea is a liberal democracy, and it'd be great if it did more. Right, of course, to venture beyond this particular region. And right. having said that, one uh, impromptu question, perhaps, for Professor uh, Kim. Keeping that in mind, Professor Kim, what more do you suppose can the UN administration do to perhaps aid Ukraine in its uh, fight against Russia, do you think? Um, you know, at the summit meeting, we, South Korea and the United States, agreed on a military. Uh, uh, you know, uh, military weapons, uh, you know, exchange program, which is called as a, a military FTA. Um, I was just wondering what it is about. And clearly, it is about the U.S. providing weapons to Ukraine uh, in a shortage. So I think uh, there are a lot of ways that United States need to uh, get supplies, uh, military weapons from other countries to be su supported to the United States so that the U.S. still can maintain its, um, you know, you know, weapon support, to, you know, level to Ukraine. So I think uh, I'm not sure if South Korea can directly support 
weapons to the Ukraine. But I think, uh, you know, by way of the United States, I think that there is a clear, you know, agreement between U.S. and South Korea that South Korea is still, you know, supplying weapons, this weapon system to Ukraine. Right. And one final question, an impromptu one, of course, to Professor Kelly as well, going back to the situation here in the Korean Peninsula with regard to North Korea. Professor Kelly, when we talk about denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, are we asking North Korea what would be more feasible, that is, asking North Korea to destroy all the nuclear weapons that it has already uh, possessed or perhaps asking them to stop making more right. nuclear weapons? Well, it sure would be great if they would go to zero, but they're not going to, right? I, I don't think any analyst out there anymore really seriously believes the North Koreans are going to go to zero. I think one of the reasons why the Americans and South Koreans and Japanese and others sort of hang on to CVID, complete, verifiable, irreversible disarmament. I think we sort of hang on to this language because it's been hanging around and nobody actually wants to be the president or the prime minister who admits that it hasn't worked. That's unfortunate because I think that keeps us latched onto a goal which is effectively impossible. We keep asking for the North Koreans to give up everything. They're not going to do it. I would like to see, and I've argued for this in my writing for many years, I would like to see the United States engage in a series of sort of small stepwise deals with the North Koreans to, as you just said, at least freeze them where they are, at least cap them so that the problem doesn't get worse. Um, I think the big problem is that that would actually require some fairly substantial concessions on our end, right? I mean, the North Koreans are conventionally very far behind the South and the United States. Missiles and nuclear weapons on top of those missiles are sort of their big strategic advantage now, and they're not going to give them up or slow down unless we give them something. And they're going to ask for a lot. They're going to ask for the closure of American bases in South Korea, for example. They're going to ask for the removal of American ground forces. They're, at, they're going to ask for an enormous amount of money. You know, we should be having these conversations, and I think one of the big missed opportunities of the Trump moon period is that we didn't actually talk about what kind of, like, smaller deals we could maybe work out with North Korea, right? Instead, Moon and Trump sort of shot for the whole thing. They went for this sort of big bang deal that just wasn't achievable. And I think they missed an opportunity to go for sort of the smaller deal that you've mentioned, right, with some kind of cap in exchange for X, Y, Z. And, and I, I'm, I feel like we missed a chance to really thrash that out. We, we didn't. Right. Hopefully things will change under the UN administration. Then, Professor Kelly, thank you very much for your insights. And Professor Kim, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts as well. Thank you for having me.